I'm a product of Penn State's 2 plus 2 program. For those of you who don't know, the 2 plus 2 program is a program that Penn State offers that allows students to earn a four-year undergraduate bachelor's degree, but doesn't require that they do all four years at the main campus. Instead, allows students to do two years at one of the 19 branch campuses strewn about the state, then after those two years, they can transition to the main campus to finish their degree. Out of high school, I was originally admitted to the main campus, in fact, into the Smith College of Business, but I found myself in that socioeconomic sweet spot where I didn't quite qualify for aid, but I certainly couldn't afford college. And so my parents and I came to the conclusion that perhaps the best financial decision might be for me to live at home for two years and commute to my local branch campus, Penn State Brandywine. While I was at Brandywine, the mental roadmap I had for my college career was to get good grades at Brandywine, transition to University Park, get good grades there, nail down a decent job, and graduate. But you see, getting decent grades was never really that hard for me. And while I was at Brandywine, I didn't challenge myself to do more. I was idling. I was on an unchallenging trajectory. Now flash forward to the fall of my junior year, I just transitioned to University Park and had the fortune of being admitted into the Schreier Honors College as a finance major. Over the first couple weeks of my first Schreier finance class, Finance 408, I came to realize that I wasn't in the same weight class as my new peers. They all abounded with accolades and achievements. They seemed to be strong academics with amazing extracurricular engagements and a plethora of professional experience. I couldn't hold a candle to them. The realization of how much more they had achieved than me was initially incredibly discouraging. I came to doubt if I was really deserving of this recently acquired Schreier designation. But over time, I warmed up to the idea that perhaps, rather than serving as an example of what I could never do, what I could never be, perhaps my peers served as an example of what my path could look like, what my trajectory could be. A year and a half later, I can say with confidence that I've caught up to my peers, and I've surpassed the expectations that I once had for myself. In a year and a half, I've gone from idling at Penn State Brandywine to standing on the stage. With thoughtful reflection, intentionality, and certainly a measure of vigor, I have changed my trajectory to better pursue my potential. Now, we've mentioned this concept of trajectory a couple times now. I think it's important that we define it. I see trajectory as the direction for our lives if things stay roughly the same as they are now, our behaviors, the way we use our time, our efforts. So now, to tie this idea into the story I've just told you, I've created a graphical model. We see trajectory one was my unchallenging trajectory at Brandywine. Trajectory two, the trajectory shown to me by my Schreier peers. Now, one of the key ideas in this concept of trajectory is that to change our trajectory or to depart from our trajectory requires a significant change in our behaviors, the way we use our time, our efforts. With that said, this is what my path to college looked like. I was on my unchallenging trajectory at Brandywine and then departed from it to reach the trajectory shown to me by my peers. The point of inflection being the moment I decided I wanted to bridge the gap between where I was and where I wanted to be. Now, when I reflect back on this journey, I think there are a few things that I did that enabled me to shape my trajectory. I first recognized the need for change. I second understood how to pursue change. And third, and I think most interesting, I conceptualized the costs of my pursuit. So now if we focus on this first piece here, recognizing a need for change, I see this as a layered issue. The first layer, and most obvious, is understanding where you are, where you're going, what your current trajectory looks like. If we, re if we relate back to the beginning of this journey for me, in the fall of my junior year, I was a strong finance major, minoring in economics. I had just been admitted to the Schreier Honors College and had an internship lined up that would give me solid career projectability. Comprehensively, I would say I was in a respectable position. Now, the second layer, one layer deeper, is deciding where you want to be. If we relate back again to this transformative period of my life, the fall of my junior year, I was originally content with my aforementioned respectability because the example set by my peers was unattainable and absurd. I couldn't hope to do what they were doing. I had placed them on a pedestal. Over time, however, getting to know my peers through conversation and getting to them on a personal level, I came to realize that they were just people. They were people, frankly, not unlike myself. And it was through this realization that I was able to remove them from their pedestal and place them alongside me as my peers and see what they were doing and imagine that I could do the same. That's how I came to decide that I wanted to follow the example that they had set. I wanted to reach the trajectory that they were on. 
Now, these first two pieces, in truth, aren't really that hard. Sure, it takes some mental legwork to decide what you want and understand where you are, but I think we've all recognized disparities in our lives between where we are and where we want to be. News resolutions are a good example of this. We resolve to do things like lose 10 pounds, read a book, fix our sleep schedule. But I think if we're honest with ourselves, we often don't fall through in these resolutions. That's because of the third piece, the core of this issue, our why. Now, I'd like to tell you a story. Shortly before going off to main campus, my father, whom I consider to be a truly brilliant man, someone whom I model myself after in many areas of my life, confided in me something. He confided in me that there were times in his life in which he didn't pursue opportunity because he didn't feel qualified for it. But over time, he found that often those opportunities were taken by people that were less qualified than he was. And this left him with a sense of regret, knowing that he had disqualified himself, that he had sold himself short of his potential for fear of failure. Now, I tell you this story because I believe that our why must be strong enough to hold up to the costs of bridging the gap between where we are and where we want to be. If it isn't, we won't lose those 10 pounds, we won't fix our sleep schedule, we won't read that book, much less will we change the trajectory for our lives. I believe that our why to catalyze real change must be in line with, or better yet, foundational to our priorities. My why was the resolution to heed the wisdom of my father and set myself on the highest professional trajectory I could so that I could never look back and think that I fell short of what I might have been able to accomplish. My why, my resolution, was to pursue my professional potential. So now after recognizing a need for change, obviously, logically, must come understanding how to pursue change. And to this, I think there are two pieces. There's what opportunities and there's what effort. Regarding what opportunities, I don't, I, I don't believe I'm in much of a position to give generalizable wisdom about, about what sort of opportunities you should pursue. I think the sort of opportunities we pursue are subjected to the unique trajectories that we wish to shape. That's to say, I wouldn't pursue the same opportunities as someone who wanted to be an artist or an athlete. The thing I will say is that when I look back on my journey, I found that people trending along the same path as me, ahead of me, beside me, and even behind me, to be invaluable resources and helping me understand what sort of opportunities are available and how to pursue them effectively. I've had the benefit of many people taking their time to invest in me and pour into me. And I'm indebted to them for the, for the service they've given me. I can't say that I would be here without them. Now, the second piece of understanding how to pursue change is what opportunities, or rather, um, what, what effort. And for this, I'd like to refer back to the model we've been building and introduce a new idea. So if you recall, this is my path through college, and we're going to introduce a new concept. And that slope is equal to effort. Now, once we introduce this idea, two things become apparent. And that's the difference that between trajectory one and trajectory two is the amount of effort it takes to sustain that trajectory, trajectory two requiring more. And to transition from trajectory one to reach trajectory two requires more effort than either trajectory does independently. And this is all to say that if we wish to raise our trajectory, we must expect an increased expenditure of effort. And with that increased expenditure of effort must come cost. And this segues nicely into the third piece of this framework, which is conceptualizing the costs of our pursuit. Now, before we begin this analysis, I'd like to make a simplifying assumption. And that's that effort is equivalent to time spent. So if we expect to spend more effort on something, we should also expect to spend more time on it. And this is an important assumption for tying together the analysis we're about to do with everything that we've previously discussed. So now to begin our analysis, let's think about the areas of our lives that we devote time to. For me, I have my curricular pursuits, I have my extracurricular pursuits, and I have my professional pursuits. And these are the areas of my life that I invest time in to raise my professional trajectory. Then I have my platonic relationships, my familial relationships, and my romantic relationship. <laughs> and these are the important people in my life that I devote time to. And then I have my personal time and my active time. And this is the time I budget for myself to foster my own well-being. And so now if we wish to continue this analysis, we can arrange them around an octagon create relationships between them, quantify those relationships, and add values. And what we see is something that looks like a spider web. It's actually known as a spider chart. And all you need to know to be able to read this is four things. 
The first is that all the vertices are labeled with the areas of my life that I devote time to. The second, the rectangles quantify how much time is dedicated to each of these areas. Third, the farther a rectangle is from the center, the more time is dedicated to a specific area. And fourth, and key, is our time is finite. So if we wish to budget more time to one area, it must come at the cost of another. So now if we wish to raise my career projectability, we have to invest my time in my curricular, extracurricular, and professional pursuits. And we see something that looks like this. Now this conceptually emulates what my life looked like at the peak of my pursuit. I think the costs of this are self-evident. My relationships were strained. My burden of stress was increased substantially. Frankly, it was a really hard time in my life. But I look back and I have to think that I accomplished most of what I set out to do. But despite this fact, the question lingers. Was it worth what it cost me? And could I have done something differently? What if I'd budgeted my time into my relationships? Well, we see this must come at the cost of my professional pursuits and my well-being. What if I budget all my time into my well-being? Well, again, this comes at the cost of my professional pursuits, but this time also my relationships. And I'm sure at this point many of you are thinking that you know, some semblance of balance must be the answer. But even here, a cost is incurred. It is not the same tangible cost of these other configurations, but it is instead a cost to our ability to pursue each of these areas maximally to be the best professional we could be, to be the best friend, to be the best son, to be the best boyfriend, to be as healthy as we can be physically and mentally. And so what we find is that no matter how we use our time, a cost is incurred. We find that opportunity cost is unavoidable. So what do we do in the face of unavoidable opportunity cost? Well, before we answer that question, I'd like to rehash some of the things that we've discussed. So first, we created a model to conceptualize this idea of trajectory, my unchallenging trajectory at Brandywine, the trajectory shown to me by my peers and my path through college. And then we introduced the idea that slope is equal to effort, which is then equal to time. So if we wish to raise our trajectory, we have to expect an increased expenditure of effort, and with that increased expenditure of effort must come an increased expenditure of time in certain areas of our lives. And because our time is finite, that must come at the cost of other areas. And then when we looked deeper into the implications of these costs, we found that no matter how we budget our time, no matter how we configure it, even in balance, opportunity cost is unavoidable. It is a non-negotiable. We will incur costs to the important areas of our lives. So where does all of this leave us? When I reflect back on this journey, in the face of unavoidable opportunity cost, I believe we have two choices. We will either employ our time in the service of the things that are important to us, or we will allow the haphazard management of our time to erode our trajectory and potentially preclude us from the lives we might wish to live. Opportunity cost is a non-negotiable. We will incur costs to the important areas of our lives. But that leaves to us how we manage those costs. The point of this hasn't been to prescribe the pursuit of your professional potential or your relationships or your well-being or, or even to prescribe balance. The point has been to challenge you to consider your priorities and think about the things that are important to you. Where do you wish to be next week, next month, next year, the next five, ten years? What are your priorities? And how are you servicing that vision for your life? How are you using your time? In the end, it's your life. How will you use it? Thank you. <laughs>